So I am at heart both a priest and a teacher. Um, I have looked at and I have used many different curriculums uh, for church education for both uh, children and adults. And um, I have found that these courses for spiritual for formation can be divided up into you know, two basic types. Um, and, I, and I want to, um, we're going to stop right there. Sorry. Do you want that thing out of the, my car? I am at heart both a priest and a teacher, and I have seen and used uh, many different curriculum uh, for Christian education, both for children and adults. And um, I have found that these courses for spiritual formation can be divided basically into two types. And um, whether, uh, you know, re without regard to whether they are um, more used by conservative or liberal Christians. So I'm gonna ask you right now to set aside those labels of conservative and liberal because I found these two types of curriculum uh, in all used by many, many different denominations. So the, the first type of curriculum drives students towards the point, towards what, the moral, the takeaway. So this is what the scripture means. This is what you're supposed to get from it. This is how you're supposed to think and live your life. Uh, these are, they're, th some of these are great curriculum. I mean, they're very uh, interesting, creative. Uh, they use all the different types of you know, cognitive learning styles from kinesthetic to auditory to visual. Uh, so they're educationally quite sound. Um, and the nice thing about them, the very attractive thing about these uh, types of curriculum, these to-the-point curriculum, is that they eliminate confusion and disequilibrium. Uh, you mean, I mean, they provide incredible comfort because they teach you uh, what the moral is, what the point is. And, you know, that can be helpful because, let's admit it, the Bible can be really confusing, right? It can be confusing, so it's nice to hear, okay, this is the point. I've used these curriculum, I preach this um, at times, so I'm not, I don't wanna throw that type out, uh, but it's only one kind. Because there's a place and a reason for allowing confusion and disequilibrium. That's how we make new meaning. Um, that's how we allow for new thoughts and new discoveries Scientific advancements are based in a time of, of disequilibrium because what the observations are not fitting with whatever our theory has been to this point. So disequilibrium is what happens uh, when we hear or see something that does not fit with what we already know or think we know or understand. And if there's anything the human mind does not like, it's cognitive dissonance. You know, it's, it's disequilibrium. We don't like that. It uses up more calories <laughs> in our brains. Um, we would rather shoehorn uncomfortable facts and realities into our inherited worldview rather than enduring the discomfort of being at a loss, I mean, of not knowing, of or definitely of out and out being wrong. We don't like that. We don't like cognitive dissonance. And yet, many, many of Jesus' parables produce exactly that. They simply, they don't fit with our preconceived um, notions of what's right and what's sensible. I mean, the son, remember the son who took his whole inheritance from his dad while his dad was still living? And he went and wasted it, and then came crawling back, and, and his dad runs out to greet him, embraces him with open arms, showers him with gifts, gives him a great feast. Remember the parable about, well, the worker who'd worked one hour and was paid the exact same as the, as the people who had worked for 10 hours in the hot sun. Or the parable about the woman who lost her coin and she searched high and low. She turned everything upside down to find that one coin. And then she throws a party that costs way more 
than the one coin that she eventually found. I mean, these parables cause us to say, what? What is going on? Unless they don't. Unless we cannot withstand the dissonance. And, and we just, you know, establish. We just establish what the scripture means and what tradition means and then teach that meaning generation after generation. This is the point of the parable of the lost coin. This is the point of the parable of the lost son. Even by titling them that, right? Even by the titles we use, we've already framed their meaning. And when we do that, when we do that, we close ourselves off to the winds of God's Holy Spirit. I mean, it says in the third chapter of the book of Revelation, chapter uh, verse 22, verse 22, book of Revelation, towards the very end of the Bible, we are reminded, let him hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the people of God, to God's church. But hearing in this way, this kind of hearing, requires us to lay down what we think we know and open ourselves to new information. I mean, this is one reason why racism can still be such a powerful and unconscious force among good Christians. Because many of us have just convinced ourselves that we are not racist. Despite the very real evidence that the policies, many policies that we support and that we enact, in fact, have racially tinged outcomes. So just because we're followers of Jesus, that does not make us immune from this human tendency to crave the comfort of believing that we know, rather than the mental stress of not knowing and just allowing for some not knowing time, time of confusion. So you can guess that the second type of curriculum well, that's imaginatively open to various possibilities, to a multiple, uh, multiple meanings. Out of, the one, out of one scripture, multiple meanings. And to the conviction that God is always speaking, always speaking, oh, using the past to illuminate the present, but not you know, misshaping the present to fit into previously constructed truths. Okay, now I've said, that's, that's a lot that I've just said. This second type of curriculum, it's a second type of way of being in the world that is open and open to the possibility that what we thought we knew is not uh, entirely accurate to, to the present realities. And that God is using the past to illuminate the present, but not choking the present into, um, you know, by, by previously construed and conceived and constructed truths. Godly play. Godly play is one example of this kind of approach to scripture and to tradition and to our own souls. Um, it, it invites us into the biblical story with a more childlike sense of wonder and, and curiosity and play even. Um, it's formed by the sense that Jesus gives us in Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 3. Ch Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. When he says, unless you change, unless you change and become as a child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now to change and become like a child means that we have to kind of let go of our ego. Let go of our power. Let go of our sense that we know what's right and what's wrong and who's in and who's out. So, so having a beginner's mind, um, let's hear this parable from this morning. And, and in a wonder, who are these bridesmaids? Who are the foolish ones and who are the wise ones? Who's the bridegroom? What is, what, what is this oil 
What does a wedding feast sound like, look like, feel like? What happened when they were all asleep, when they all fell asleep? And how did they all wake up? Now, the trick for us adults, of course, is not to leap to conclusions. I mean, to leap over all the various answers that those questions raise, um, to grab hold of the one answer, the point of the story that you may have been taught. I mean, my friends, let's just imagine. What might happen if the bridesmaids who ran out of oil simply stayed where they were? In the darkness, in the doubt, in the confusion, in the dissonance. What might happen when the bridegroom did arrive and they had not run away in their anxiety over the thinking that they had something that they were supposed to have, and they were still present, even in their darkness and in their embarrassment, to welcome him. I mean, what graciousness might he extend to them? What invitation might they receive to a party uh, where famously the last are first, and the first are last, and the needy are not forgotten, and the hope of the poor is not taken away. What might happen if we stay, if we just stay in our confusion, if we stay in our doubt, if we stay in like a space of not knowing? In 516, it's a long time ago, okay, 516, St. Benedict began his famous rule for Christian communities with this instruction. These are the first words of the famous rule of St. Benedict from 516. Listen, hearken continually with thine heart, O son, give attentive ear. Now remember that verse from Revelation? Let those who have an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying. The truth is the way we listen, the way we listen, it makes all the difference. The way we listen to God, the way we listen to Scripture, the way we listen to each other. And when St. Benedict says, listen continually within your heart, he means continually. He means listen and re-listen and ponder and refrain for as long as you're able from jumping to a conclusion. So I want to invite you this week to challenge yourself, whether it's with your child or your spouse or your friend. Um, When they are speaking, even if you think 100% you know what they mean, Listen again. Listen with the ears of your heart, as one of our prayers says. Challenge yourself to, you know, to allow for new meanings to emerge. You know, the new meaning might not even be in them. It might be in yourself. But challenge yourself to listen deeper. And then try being this gracious with your fellow countrymen. Because as we move forward as a nation, whether your preferences for our electoral leadership were um, confirmed or disappointed, let's try this second way. This way of staying open and staying curious, of wondering and refraining from leaping to conclusions. Let's try as a church, as a people who follow Jesus, to discipline ourselves to accept the discomfort, okay, to accept the discomfort of cognitive dissonance, of not knowing precisely what the meaning of this election is, what the meaning of the parables is, what the meaning of your own spouse is, what the meaning of your own beautiful, unique self is. This is how new meanings emerge. It's how new thoughts emerge. It's how new possibilities emerge. It's how new worlds emerge. So let's begin together on this path uh, with beginner's minds, admitting that we don't know, and so becoming teachable. Amen.